Jonathan woke up with a massive headache. His marriage was over. His wife was gone, sleeping in the arms of another man, as she had been doing for over a year now. He made his way to the bathroom and got under the shower, letting the cold water wake him up until it was warm enough to soothe him. He washed and dried himself and stood in front of the mirror, assessing himself. She was at least partially right. His hair, cheaply cut at the barber, had thinned on the top of his head and was bare at the top of his head. His stomach was bigger than he would have liked, and his waist was a size 42 instead of the size 34 he'd graduated with. He looked old and tired, like the middle-aged men he'd made fun of in his youth, certain he'd never let himself do that. He raised his hands, powerful, but not the hands of a middle-aged fat man. Manual labor took care of that. The belly, on the other hand, must go. He turned his head, examining his hair from different angles. Searching under the sink, he found an old pair of scissors left over from when he'd worn a beard for months. She didn't like it, so he gave in and shaved it off. Five minutes later, Jonathan pulled out his razor and smiled at his own appearance. Half a can of shaving cream had turned his head into a white beast. He was new at this, and it took a few passes before he got the result he wanted. Better. Not good, but better. Leaning closer to the mirror, he plucked two hairs from his eyebrows that seemed to be on their own. The small cuticle scissors took care of the hairs in his nostrils, which unfortunately grew faster than the hairs on the top of his head. He studiously avoided thinking about how to deal with the situation. Would he accept her back? Would he be able to endure being married to the woman who had so unceremoniously discarded their marriage? A whole year of cuckolding, admitting it to him without guilt or remorse, and then leaving to do it again. Forget her words. Actions spoke louder, and her actions screamed. There was no way to deal with it. No way. A one-time accidental slip-up, maybe. But an ongoing affair with a man she claimed to love? She'd thrown it in his face, insisting he put up with it, or she'd ruin his life. She wasn't perfect either. Since the birth of their youngest child, she had put on at least 20 pounds. She was 34 years old. Her hair was no longer the luxurious mane it used to be. She wore it short now, claiming it was easier to groom that way. Not that he had any say in the matter. She hadn't cared about his opinion in years. Two, to be exact. Jonathan rubbed his chin and decided not to shave. He'd always liked his beard. There was no reason why he couldn't wear it now. He looked through his closet, mostly old clothes, since he didn't like spending money on himself when he could spend it on his family. He found the least objectionable things he owned and dressed carefully to face the first day of the rest of his life. He wasn't a rich lawyer or a CEO, nor was he a slick accountant or a former Navy SEAL. He was a simple man, a diesel engine mechanic, but a man of action. So he went to the bank. It didn't take long to withdraw everything they had. Overtime helped, and they managed to save almost 7000 Before the overtime started, they were living a little more than paycheck to paycheck. His annual bonuses and tax refunds were the only thing that improved their savings. He went across the street and opened a new bank account, depositing $1,000 into it. They were pleased with his business, and he earned a new toaster oven for his efforts. The next order was more complicated. Jonathan went to the Caterpillar dealership and hand-wrote his own resignation letter. His boss tried to talk him out of it, but Jonathan was determined. He explained the situation. His wife had been cheating on him for over a year. He was not going to pay for her to live with a new lover. He left, taking her word that if the situation changed, there would be room for him. By the time he left, he had received his last paycheck, including vacation pay. He changed his health insurance, dropping his wife from it, and dropped his life insurance with the company. He was able to take out an independent policy protecting his children. Nothing for the whore. After taking care of the essentials, he went home and started making phone calls. He canceled their only credit card. It wasn't hard, the limit was small, and they couldn't afford to accumulate debt, so they paid it off every month. With another call, he removed his wife from the cell phone plan. Let her have her own. Maybe her boyfriend could pay for it. 
He realized he had missed breakfast and lunch and was hungry. It had been a busy morning. Looking in the fridge, he thought Susan might not have been happy about his beer belly, but she certainly wasn't helping. There was nothing useful in the fridge. Sodas, snacks, cold cuts, bacon, instant lunches, and of course, beer. No wonder they'd both put on extra pounds. Jonathan whipped up some eggs and made them into a sandwich. Not the healthiest meal, but the best he could do. The first steps had been taken, but he didn't know what to do next. He was reacting on instinct. Last night he decided to get angry and drunk, wallowing in self-pity. This morning he decided to protect himself and stop supporting her. Now we didn't know what to do. There was too much he didn't understand, and his thoughts were spinning. His wife was a cheating whore, and his marriage was over. He felt he could not handle this alone, and turning to his family, he went to his grandfather's house. If he had been offered the chance to talk to his grandfather Max or his mother, he would have chosen the old man. His mother was a woman, and at that moment he was afraid that for the sake of her family and children, she might side with the whore. Grandpa was an honest man, and would at least give him his opinion. And the 70-year-old grandfather was surprised to see his grandson on his doorstep. John? What's this new look? Only Grandpa Max called him John. Jonathan rubbed his smooth dome in embarrassment. Grandpa, I need some advice. Grandpa Schritter was a comeback kind of guy, the son of German immigrants. His father had dug a ranch in the wilderness, and Grandpa had expanded it. He had few friends, but those he had held similar values. He was strict with his children. Rules had to be followed, or there would be consequences. He could be described as old-fashioned. His integrity and values were the foundation of the ranch's growth and success. In a time of slick lawyers and 50-page contracts, Max Schritter was bound by a handshake. Uncle Len, the oldest, became the rancher and lived in a large house 100 yards from the old homestead. Growing up as he did, he upheld his family's legacy of hard work, fairness, honesty, and loyalty to friends. It only took half an hour to tell the story. The old man had no tolerance for lies, deceit, or trickery, especially when it came to family. How are you going to get rid of it? Was his only question. It's not that easy. We have three kids. She's a cheating whore. Take the kids and kick her ass out. Jonathan smiled. If only it were that simple. It doesn't work that way anymore, Grandpa. The kids almost always go to the mother, especially if she takes care of them. She gets half of everything, and probably a lot more. I'll have to pay for three children and maintenance to look after her since she can't work. Won't work, you mean? Lazy-ass, cheating whore. Jonathan was taken aback by the old man's words. He'd rarely heard the old man swear, not in that tone of voice, never in front of a woman or children. Apparently, Jonathan was no longer a child. That's the law, Grandfather. I don't like it, but I suspect she's mostly right. She thinks she has me on the hook and is going to force me to take medication. I don't believe that pile of manure you're throwing around. He stood up and reached for his old cell phone. A rotary dialer made like a tank. Jonathan knew the phone was older than himself. Bill? Max here? I need your expert opinion on a matter. How soon can you get your sorry ass off the couch and over here? After a short reply, Grandpa hung up the phone. What's the plan? I want to get rid of the house. I can't afford it. I was hoping the kids and I could stay here. I'm not going to pay for her to live happily ever after with her son-of-a-bitch lover. Let her find somewhere else to live. Jonathan knew they had no ownership of the place, not even two years later. And then it hit him. Two goddamn years, the same time she'd started dating the asshole. Bought her the house she'd begged for, and she was having an affair. Yeah, she really loved him, didn't she? His grandfather nodded. No problem. We still have four empty rooms filled with 50-year-old junk. It'll be great to get some young blood in here. Who's going to look after them while you're at work? I'm not going to work. Let her get child support from an unemployed man. How are you going to live? I was hoping Uncle Len would let me work on the ranch under the table. I've got experience. 
I've spent enough summer days sweating out here. He'll be able to pay you, and you'll make sure the kids aren't out of work. Maybe I can get a token salary to cover my expenses. I don't think I'll need much. Car insurance, food, clothes. Grandpa looked at him. No token paycheck. The man lives under my roof. He works. We'll figure out a way to make sure she doesn't get your money. We'll have to think about finding some kind of guardian for your kids. Jonathan heard the sound of a truck pulling into the driveway. The clatter of the big diesel was clearly audible indoors. He got up to open the door, but Bill Wesley, one of his grandfather's oldest friends, entered without knocking. What made you fuss, Max? The newcomer asked. It took another 20 minutes of explaining the situation before Bill had enough. It's mostly true. She'll probably get the kids, and Sonny will have to pay child support, pay the mortgage, and support her crooked ass. You said the advice was given to her by her lover? Is he a lawyer? Jonathan nodded. Big slip of the tongue. That's not kosher. He could be disbarred. What do you know about him? Nothing. He's younger and a divorce lawyer. That's all I know. And I think his wife died in an accident a couple years ago. He was driving. Damn. There aren't too many like that around here. Let me make some calls and see what I can find out. He leaned back in his chair, apparently concentrating. What did you do with the finances? Emptied the accounts. Quit my job. Good. A lot of these new panty-wearing lawyers say you should only take half. That's bullshit. She'll get half eventually, but don't make it easy on the whore. Make her fight for it. Keep your cool. Why did you quit your job? I was working too much overtime. I'll be damned if I let the courts determine alimony and child support based on a 60-hour work week. I won't be able to pay much if I'm out of work. Any chance you can get your boss to fire you instead of quitting? The courts look at it much more favorably. You quit, and they count how much you can afford from last year. If you get fired, there's a lot more room to maneuver. Jonathan smiled at the older man's analysis. Judge Bill Wesley had been a circuit court judge for longer than he could remember, and had only retired a few years ago. He knew how things worked better than anyone. Her family puts up with this shit? Doesn't sound like the Finnegans I know. They don't know yet. No one does. She wants us to keep it a secret. Like hell we do. Damn whore thinks she can hide her cheating, doesn't she? He pulled a 10-year-old flip phone from his pocket and after rummaging through his contacts for a minute, waited for the voice on the other end of the line. Jimmy, Bill here. I've got some hard news for you. I don't want to be the one to tell you. No, nothing like that. Your granddaughter Susan is married to Schritter. I mean Fremont. She's cheating on him. No, I'm not kidding. No, didn't catch her or anything. She came out herself and told him last night. Said she's been doing it for a year. She's not going to leave, at least according to her. She wants him to get over it and let her keep having fun. Hell no. Of course not. You think he's some kind of asshole? Yeah, I know. That's hard to hear. Always been a selfish little bitch. I'm not sure yet, but it's not good. I thought you should know. I'm sorry I'm with you. Of course I'll tell him. Bill turned to Jonathan, anger boiling in his eyes. Broke Grandpa's heart, you slut. No one wants to think their kids will grow up like that. He's sorry, he says. Thanks. Damn, that's so hard to believe. His grandfather spoke up. You said she might come back today? You need to go home and get this under control. Make sure you make it clear you're not going to go along with what she's doing. No man in his right mind would do that. I think I've already done that. Dad, what are you going to do with that monstrous house you bought? I guess I'm going to let the bank take it. The old judge spoke up. If her name is on the deed, she can stop you. I don't know what else can be done. For now, I'd say stay in the house. Control your finances and stop making payments. You never heard it from me, but you can hide your money. Hide the cash. Go to Oklahoma and lose most of it at the Indian casinos. Take a couple months if you can stand it. Get yourself in shape and delay payments enough that there is no way out. Then you'll deal with her. If you divorce her now, your ass will be in the grass. Play with her on your line for a while. Stall for time. 
Grandpa gave him a look. I don't want to be the one to say it, but you've let yourself go, kid. You'll be back on the market soon. You might as well use this time to get ready. That stupid bitch thinks you can't get a woman? Hell, there's nothing in the world easier. We'll get you back in the saddle in no time. Jonathan was a little sensitive on the matter. I'm not the only one who's allowed myself to relax. She's not perfect. The old man laughed. No, but it doesn't matter. A decent woman willing to spread her legs will always find someone to park between them. There's no denying she still looks great. It's just a shame. I hope you're not looking for that kind of relationship. Your kids need a real woman, not some slut. I'm not ready to date, Grandpa. Besides, I'm still married. In spirit, you're not married. She left you. Remember that. You had no choice in the matter. She has a new love now. Everything you think you had is over. You don't owe her anything. Hell, we can sit around and talk all day, but it's not going to get us anywhere. Go home. I'll talk to Len about getting you a job. Stop by my place tomorrow, and we'll have a little chat and see what Bill figures out. Jonathan returned home feeling better. His feelings and reactions to his wife's ambush had been validated by his elders. He had nothing to do, and he already missed his family. He wondered if he had overreached by quitting his job and closing his account so quickly. It was too late to worry about spilled milk. At least he felt a little more in control, not reacting to whatever the bitch insisted was her right. He looked in the fridge again, trying to figure out what he was going to eat. He saw a large stack of takeout menus next to the fridge and looked at them in disgust. No wonder they had no money and were out of shape. He tossed the TV dinners into the trash can along with the menus. When Susan didn't call or show up by 7 o'clock, he drove to the supermarket and filled the basket with healthier foods. When he got home, Susan was already waiting for him. She looked at him and stepped back in shock. Jonathan? His new look was unexpected. Susan, he replied calmly, picked up half a dozen grocery bags and headed for the kitchen. She followed him. I wanted to apologize for the way things turned out last night. It didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. I didn't mean to hurt you. Are you calm now? Sober? Can we talk like adults? He shrugged. It doesn't matter how you said it. Knowing you left our marriage for some young stud was painful no matter what. She berated herself again. She knew it would hurt him. With men, it always came down to sex. Why couldn't he realize that was the least of their problems? Please, Jonathan, I shouldn't have said anything. It was unconscionable. That's not the point. He laughed. Not anymore, that's for sure. I'll never touch you now, not even with a stick. What do you want, Susan? His words shocked her. He had never spoken to her like that. Not once in eleven years of marriage. She felt anger building in her but tried to remain calm. She didn't need a repeat of last night. I want you to understand what I'm going through. This isn't easy for me. I didn't want to fall in love with him. I only wanted to help him through a difficult time. It shouldn't affect us. I love you, and I will never leave you. I see. You're in love with him now. I understand. Thank you for that. Is there anything else you want to say? Maybe you want to open up my chest, rip out my heart, and dance on it? Please tell me how inadequate I am, how I can't fulfill your needs, how I deserve to be treated like garbage. I'm sure you've prepared many sharp barbs to hurt me as much as possible. Plan this whole damn conversation like the one you ambushed me with last night. No, Jonathan, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. You're my husband, the father of my children, my soulmate. Always love you. I just need to be near him. Don't you understand? It's important to me. For us. So go to him. I have no desire to be in the same house with a cheating wife who doesn't want me. Go away. Please. I'm sick of your presence here. She cried. I know you don't want this. You're only trying to hurt me. I know you love me, and you're coming to figure out what's best for all of us, for the children. I... I'll bring them home tomorrow. They don't need to know about our problems. No one does. It's between us. 
if we have any problems, we can discuss them in private. And what am I supposed to say when you spend the night at your lover's house? I don't. I never did, until last night, and I don't intend to. You scared me last night with your drunken, rude behavior. I thought you might hurt me. I couldn't stay here. I've never done this before. It could be the way things have been for the last year. I don't think so. I think if you're waiting until tomorrow to pick them up, that means you're going to spend the night spreading your whore legs for your boyfriend's lover again. Please don't call him that. He's a good man. A good man. Right. The kind of man who can't find his own woman and has to steal someone else's. So nice. So good. So honorable. Go to him already before I throw up. She stood up and slowly walked away. I'll give you some time, she said. I realize this is a shock to you. I wish it were easier to say. I love you and I never meant to hurt you. You can tell me that's a lie. That my loving wife isn't really a cheating whore. Damn it, Jonathan. I'm not a whore. I can't believe you can say that. I'm not running after you. This isn't some dirty affair. I love this man. Calling me names and insulting me isn't helping anything. Are you trying to get me to divorce you and ruin your life? Did you love him when you first spread your legs in front of him? When you broke your vows, abandoned your family, and became a cheating whore? Did you love him then? She stood there with her mouth hanging open. He was right. She remembered how guilty she'd felt that first time. How she'd come home and cried in the shower until the water was cold. Told Rich they could never do it again. She cared about him. But loving him? No, she didn't love him. She loved the way he made her feel needed. She turned and walked away, angry that he made her feel guilty for something that was good and right. He needed her. When she left, he could barely keep himself from going back and finishing whatever was left of the gym beam. Instead, he made a salad, ate a skinless chicken breast, and went for a long walk. He didn't feel better, but at least he didn't feel worse. Next chapter. Jonathan got up on his alarm clock and was at his grandfather's house by 8 o'clock in the morning. He treated it as just another day of work. He was surprised to find the old man's entire team there. They were a close-knit group. On the mantel above the fireplace hung a picture of five of them dressed in their green uniforms, Eagle Scouts. They had been best friends all their lives. It's hard to imagine that in this day and age you can have four best friends that you can rely on always, for over 60 years. They always met trouble face to face as a team. Jonathan was lucky to have them on his side. He was ushered into the dining room where a large farm breakfast was served. Seven servings. Jonathan looked around once more and saw that his uncle Len was here too. He took his seat and then Bill's wife came out, offering coffee to those who wanted it. Daryl's wife appeared behind her, proudly carrying a plate of hotcakes about eight inches high, each as wide as the plate. Jonathan laughed. So much for my diet, he said. Uncle Len cut a couple of hotcakes with a knife and placed them on Jonathan's plate. Enjoy. Trust me, working on the ranch will burn up all the calories you can get. You're starting at the bottom. Along with Bill and his grandfather, two of the other men were retirees. Daryl Smith was a career army officer and worked another dozen years as a teacher after retiring at age 30 with the rank of bird colonel. He still occasionally moonlighted as a teacher, but no more than a few weeks a year. James Croom was another of the old German immigrants and owned a ranch that adjoined his grandfather's from the south. It was now run by his two sons, but he continued to keep his hand in and faithfully attended all the cattle auctions. A Vietnam War veteran, he joined Daryl but left the service after two tours when his older brother died, leaving him in line to receive the ranch. Carl Jenkins's family owned the town's first market and hardware store. They were a well-to-do family, their livelihood independent of the weather, the cost of feed, and the vagaries of the beef market. Obviously, they were all aware of his situation. Once the friendly chatter subsided, Bill got down to business. First of all, we're behind you, 100%. I hope you don't mind, but our wives have joined the conversation. 
They can help from a woman's point of view. You had to know that if we got involved, we wouldn't be able to keep them out of it. Not a problem, sir. I understand. Good. How much does your mother know? He asked. Nothing so far. I haven't told anyone except you and Grandpa. She has to know. She'll be very angry if she finds out that her father and brother found out before she did. Tonight, okay? Jonathan nodded. Not a conversation he was looking forward to having. Fine. The bastard's name is Rich Patton. Worked as a paralegal at Bell & Richards. Apparently came back for his law degree after his wife died. Big insurance payout made it possible. I don't know if he passed the bar exam. Looks like he did, though. Supposedly he's a pretty smart guy and has a good reputation. But that doesn't make him any less of a bastard. I know you don't want to hear this, but it seems like everyone at the law firm knows about your wife's involvement. The only thing they didn't know was that she was married. Apparently she's been hiding that little fact. The former judge caught the attention of the entire group as they devoured their breakfast. Jonathan noticed the four older women standing near the kitchen listening. Jonathan took a bite of a piece of thick applewood smoked bacon. The only real question before we start is whether there's any chance of reconciliation. She's the mother of your children, three, under the age of ten, right? Five, eight, and ten, Jonathan said. His grandfather spoke up. Do you want her back, boy? That's the big question. Can you survive a year of debauchery and get her back? Maximilian, shrieked one of the women. Jonathan recognized her as the judge's wife. You have no right to call her a whore. We haven't heard her side of the story yet. Don't complicate things. The judge turned to face his wife. Judith, you said you wouldn't get involved unless you were asked for your opinion. I won't let you give it. She's ruined everything. We all know that. The boy has to decide for himself if he wants to try to patch things up for the sake of the family. Don't try to make her look worse than she really is. She's been screwing around with another man behind his back for a year, and now she wants him to accept that there's a new man in their lives. What else do you call a wife who has had an affair for over a year and refuses to give it up? Confused? I don't know. They should figure it out for themselves if they want to. Let him decide for himself. Jonathan spoke up. She came by again last night. Didn't stay. Went back to her lover. No apology, except that she says she didn't mean to offend me. Has no intention of ending her affair. Still threatens me. I can't take it. The colonel spoke for the first time. What if she does give it up? Is it too late? Jonathan took a few seconds to ponder that question. I don't. If she stopped it, realized how much it hurt, if she repented and I believed it wouldn't happen again, then maybe. That's a lot of ifs for maybe. Do you think there's any chance of that happening? Honestly? No. She says she loves him. She's in love with him. Says he's a great lover. I don't see what the big deal is. She had no right to tell me about her private life with him. She tried to hurt me. She threatened me with divorce and ruin. Hid the kids from me. She wants to cheat and laughs at the idea of me finding another woman and says if I do, she will divorce me. As if that's fair. No, I want her out of my life. The colonel's wife, Diane, spoke up. That's not going to happen, Jonathan. She's the mother of your children. Like it or not, she's going to be in your life for at least the next 13 years, unless you plan on giving up your children. They're my children, my responsibility, Jonathan snapped back. Understandable, but they're hers too. You can divorce her, but if it's bitter and hurtful, you'll have to live with that for the next couple decades, Diana said. Hurtful? Like telling me she had an affair for a year and he was a better lover than me? That she's keeping him whether I like it or not? And if I cause trouble, she'll divorce me, make me pay, and laugh while I live in a cardboard box supporting her, replied Jonathan angrily. His grandfather stood up. Lady, we invited you here to offer advice and share wisdom. You agreed not to interfere until you were asked to speak. I don't think you're going to help right now. Please leave us alone for now, and we'll plug you in when he makes a decision on how to move forward. A slight murmur was heard, but the women retired to the living room, leaving the men alone. What do you want, Jonathan? 
as simple as possible. I want her gone. I want to take the children. I don't want to support her. I don't want to pay for her to have a good time with her lover. I want him to suffer if I can. Both of them, if I'm honest with myself. I'd like to separate them. Maybe even make them hate each other. The older men looked at each other, and they all began to slowly smirk. The colonel nodded. Good. So we're all on the same page. This is a war. The battle lines have been delineated. Now it's just a matter of tactics. Next chapter. In three hours of non-stop discussion and argument, the basic plan was worked out. By this point, the women had joined in over lunch, and although they were not enthusiastic about the decision, they supported it. Jonathan called home and left a message. I won't be home tonight, he said, and tomorrow night too. I'll see you Sunday. Leaving the Eagles and their wives to deal with first things first, Jonathan headed to his mother's house, wanting to be home in time for her arrival from work. She greeted him, marveling at his new appearance. What brings you here? You could have called. I need to talk to you, Mom. It's important. After a few minutes of his explanation, she cried. There's no chance you'll take her back? She's the mother of your children, Jonathan. She's given you eleven good years. Nine, really. That's when she started seeing her lover. Is divorce really the only solution? No one wins in divorce? I don't see any other solution, Mom. Honestly. She doesn't want to give him up. She loves him, she says. She's been having fun with him for a year. I can't accept that. His mother nodded. It breaks my heart, kid. I have to tell you. Mine too. Trust me. What can I do? Do you need help watching the kids on weekends or evenings? Right now I'm staying in the house. I haven't started the divorce yet. She might want to soon. But I'm not going to help her. I'm not going to pay for her to be with her new love. I'm shutting her down. If she wants money, she'll have to get a job. I'll pay for the house and food and take care of the kids, but she won't get a dime unless it's court-ordered. His mother nodded. She should probably get a job. She'll need it when you two are done. I want you to come with me to talk to her parents. I don't want them watching the kids while she bullies me. I'm sure they won't do that, his mother said worriedly. They did. The only question is whether they knew why. At 20 minutes later, they were already knocking on the door of the Finnegan's house. Jonathan, you've changed so much, said Susan's mother. You've already missed them. Susan picked up the kids over an hour ago. Actually, I came to talk to you and Dad. Can we come in? Of course. Carolyn, it's good to see you. Can I get you something to drink? She called into the house. Terry, Jonathan and his mother are here. Something non-alcoholic would be nice, his mother said. Ginger ale? His mother nodded and he said, I'll have the same, thanks. They were sitting in the living room when Brenda brought them their drinks, and Terry followed. Brenda sat down. Is something wrong? You don't look... well? He nodded. I wish you'd stop covering for Susan while she's having an affair. Brenda made it look like she'd been slapped, and Terry blushed. How the hell can you say that? growled Terry angrily. She's been seeing her lover for a year, and you're watching the kids while she does it. I wish you'd stop it. I think it's beneath you to support her cheating on me. Brenda spoke first. That's just ridiculous. She loves you and the kids. She's not having an affair. We wouldn't be covering for her if she was. She spent the last couple nights at her lover's house while you watched the kids. Two days ago, she told me she's in love with him and has been seeing him for the last year. She doesn't see him at night. She's at home with her family. That means she sees him during the day. I doubt she takes the kids with her. Are you telling me you haven't watched our children several times a week for the last year? Brenda sat with her mouth open. She... She said she volunteers at a women's shelter. Unless that bastard beats her, the only thing in danger is our marriage, Jonathan said. Terry looked confused. She told you? Was she having an affair? She's having an affair. She denies it. She says she loves him, 
but she wants me to take care of her and the kids. I'll be damned if I'm going to pay her to have fun with another man. Brenda was on the verge of tears. I can't believe this. I can believe she's using us to cover up her cheating. I wish you would stop. You're helping her destroy our marriage. As long as she's dating him, there's no hope for us. Can you understand that? Terry's face turned red. You're not guilty of anything, I suppose? Have you cheated on her? No. You have no reason to believe I cheated. My only fault is that I worked too many hours to pay for that damn house she had to have and to have new underwear for her boyfriend. I... I may have given myself a bit of a hard time. Gained a few pounds, worked too many hours, came home too tired to give her enough attention, maybe. But I don't see why she should have a new lover for a whole year. Do you think that's right? His wife's father cast a glance at him. I don't know what is right or wrong. I'm only hearing one side of the story. I won't judge until I hear her side of the story. Of course, I understand. Daddy's little girl can't do wrong. She can't be a cheating whore, can she? Stop watching the kids so she can have fun, snapped Jonathan. I think you'd better leave, growled Terry angrily. It's to my advantage. What kind of people cover for their daughter so she can be a traitor, constantly abandoning their children? Who raises children like that? Jonathan replied with defiance. Out! Terry shouted, his Irish temper in full bloom. Carolyn couldn't believe how belligerent he had become so quickly. She looked regretfully at Brenda. Jonathan paid them no attention and headed for the door. Congratulations on raising a whore, Daddy. Good job. He snapped in farewell. His mother snapped back. How could you talk to them like that? I wanted to piss him off. She'll feel his blow on her if she kept it from them. If not, if they knew about it, then screw them. They deserved it. Next chapter. Jonathan headed north to the Oklahoma border. He'd been told his job was to collect as many losing checks as he could, get a hotel room for a couple of nights, play a little, and maybe collect his ashes. He felt no guilt over the idea of sleeping with another woman. The moment his wife confessed her year-long affair and said she was going to keep seeing the bastard, their marriage was over. Now they were just passing the time until the paperwork was done. His phone had started ringing within minutes of leaving town, but he'd turned it off before he'd even left the state line. He figured it was about to go off the rails. Well, she made her bed, let her sleep in it. It's not like that whore didn't have company. He tried his luck at a couple tables and then headed for the bar. Not half an hour later, he was already talking to a gorgeous woman who had an ointment for his pain and was willing to lend it to him. He felt a fleeting sense of guilt at paying $400 for the woman, like he was cheating. Then he laughed to himself. The bitch had been doing this for a year. Why shouldn't he do it too? At least he wasn't emotionally involved. Then, as he escorted her out of his room, he grinned. Best $400 he'd ever spent. $400 that would never go to a whore wife. The next day, he wandered around the casino a bit, played a little craps and poker, losing a couple hundred bucks. In the kino and sports betting rooms, he picked up dozens of receipts, thousands of dollars worth. He went to a show and found another pretty woman who was happy to trade her services for a few hundred bucks. Not as young and pretty as the previous guest, she was closer to his age and very malleable. He'd managed to get her for only $300, and he'd gotten even more use out of her than he'd gotten out of the tall blonde the night before. He figured it would be for the long haul. He'd be damned if he was going to be doing anything with his whore wife anytime soon. It had been so good, he'd left her another $50. She gave him a business card and told him to contact her anytime he needed company. He kept it. That night, Jonathan felt fed but lonely in the big bed. He thought about his broken marriage and everything his wife had done with her younger and better lover. Bitch. How could she do that to him? To her only children? How selfish can a person be? To give up her marriage for some stranger to entertain her? What kind of man decides to steal another man's wife? Probably a lawyer. Lying cheats, all of them. 
scum of the earth. The next morning he got a good night's sleep, stood in front of the mirror and tidied himself up. He shaved his head, checking carefully for rough spots, then applied aftershave. He trimmed his beard where it was poking through and gave it a neat look. He almost didn't recognize himself in the mirror. Jonathan pulled up to his house a little after noon. His wife's car was in place and he prepared for battle. Upon entering the house, the children saw him first and pounced on him. They laughed, wanted to touch his head, asked where his hair was. Where was he? Why hadn't he come home? His wife stared at him, anger boiling inside her. He laughed along with the children. Daddy had business out of town. Now I'm back, and I won't have to leave again anytime soon. Susan scooted closer. We need to talk, honey, she whispered. Soon. I'd like to spend some time with my kids since they're not at your parents' house. Jonathan sat down in front of the TV with the kids, talking about their time with their grandparents. I bet you like staying with them, don't you? You see them a lot, a lot more often than you do with your other grandmother. A lot more often, the older Cindy said. Grandma picks Joey and me up after summer school. The plot thickens, Jonathan thought. And she's watching Nancy. Little Nancy nodded. Susan stood over them. Jonathan, I'd really like to talk, she said. And I'd like to have a faithful wife, Jonathan snapped back. It looks like neither of us will get what we want. She stepped back as if he'd slapped her. Is that what you want? To say everything here now in front of the kids? She hissed. No, I'll talk to you when I'm ready. It took you two years to talk to me. And now you're in a hurry to go somewhere? Jonathan looked at her with cold eyes. She turned and, sobbing, ran to their bedroom. Why is mommy crying? Joey asked. Your mom has been very naughty. She knows she's in trouble, explained Jonathan. Did she break something? asked Nancy. Breaking something was the worst thing you could do. Yes, she broke it, he answered. Her wedding vows, his heart, their marriage. He spent a few more minutes with the kids and prepared himself for the confrontation ahead. He walked into the bedroom and closed the door behind him. How could you? shrieked Susan. I told you we didn't need to involve my parents. I told you I didn't want you having fun here, Jonathan said calmly. Where the hell have you been the last two nights? Off to the side. Where have you been for the last two years? Where? What are you up to? It's none of your business anymore. Once you chose him over me, you lost any right to ask me about it. She was tired of this argument. Why isn't my phone working? I canceled your service, just like I canceled your health insurance, just like I canceled your credit card. Why? Why did you do that? Are you that petty? I'm not going to pay you to have fun at my expense. If you want to be a whore, do it on your own dime, Jonathan explained. I'm not a whore. I'm in love with another man. Are you so shallow, so selfish that you can't see the difference? So I'm the selfish one? Because I want my wife to remember her wedding vows? To be faithful to me and our children? Don't bring the children into this. No, you did. Getting rid of them every day so you could spend time in bed with your lover. We didn't spend time in bed. I took care of him. I was helping him. He needed me. How exactly did you take care of him, dear Susan? Don't be a smartass. I, I cooked. I did the laundry. I cleaned a little. Sometimes I accompanied him for walks. We used to talk. He took the time to talk to me. He understood me, didn't ignore me for TV and beer. So you were his wife, cooking for him while we ate takeout. Talk to him when you ignored me and abandoned your children. You traded that family for another. Fine. Let your other husband pay for your cell phone, your insurance. Let him give you money for expenses. Buy you nice clothes. Trade the fun for money from a man you're not married to. You say you're not a whore? Why are you doing this? It doesn't have to be this way. We've been happy for the last year, haven't we? I've never forced you to do without. Why can't we go back to that? Don't you love me at all? Have you ever loved me? She whimpered, tears glistening in her eyes. Back then, I didn't know you were a cheating whore yet. 
Now every time I see you, I picture you in the arms of your lover, your young man. That's not the point, Jonathan. It isn't at all. You need to let it go. Give your fragile ego a break. It's about love and friendship. He cares for me and I care for him. We love each other. I never said he's better than you. He's different, that's all. I still love you. I... I need him. It's okay. See him all you want. I don't care about that. But as long as you see him, I won't pay for it. He loves you. He can pay for you. Don't think he hasn't offered. He's rich. Not like you, working day and night to keep a roof over your head somehow, she exclaimed angrily, immediately regretting her words. What is it, Susan? Is it love or do you just want to switch? Are you mad because I'm working my ass off to give you the house you wanted, to take care of our kids? I work 60 hours a week so you can have everything you need. And what do you do? You don't work? You don't take care of the kids? You hardly ever cook? What are you doing for this family that I'm busting my ass for? I... I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. I've always appreciated how hard you work for us. You... You just make me so angry. Why can't we have things the same old way? Stop seeing him. Be a loving, faithful wife and a good mother. Then we'll see if things can't be the way they were for the long nine years until you threw your marriage away. I didn't throw anything away. I was always there for you. I only saw him when you were working and the kids were in school. I always put my family first. Like the two nights you spent at his house, when I was working, when the kids were in school? You drove me to his place. You know I did. I was afraid of you. The second night you begged me to go to his place. I know it's always my fault. You didn't do anything wrong. I didn't. I can't help how I feel. Jonathan sighed. This is getting us nowhere. Are you going to stop seeing him? No. Then you're on your own. This is my bedroom. You can stay here, but I'm not leaving. I'll keep feeding you when you're home and I'll keep paying for your car and insurance so you can take care of the kids. It's going to be tight here. Why? What do you mean? I quit my job. It was getting too much in the way of my family. You quit? Without discussing it with me? Shrieked Susan. You had fun with another man without discussing it with me? Jonathan mocked her. It's not the same thing, she said. I know it is. It's much worse than that. I'll be working for Uncle Len. I won't make as much as he does, but we can feed ourselves if we're careful. No more wasteful spending. I never waste money, she said. How much gasoline do you use driving to Rich and your parents' house every day? How many lunches, coffee shop meetings? Eh? It took a few seconds before she realized what he'd said. Like, who said his name was Rich? Richard Patton. Rich for his whores. A paralegal and amateur living off the money he made by killing his wife. Some lover you have. It's not like that. He didn't kill her. It was an accident. It wasn't his fault. And he's not a paralegal. He's a lawyer. He graduated from law school and passed the bar exam. He's not an amateur. He must work very hard since he can spend all his days entertaining you. Stop saying that! She shouted. Jonathan stared at her. I thought you were the one who wanted to do this in private. If you're going to yell, we can invite the kids over. If you must know, we only make love a few days a week. God, Susan, you're such a goddamn slut. You disgust me. No, Jonathan, don't say that. I love you. I wouldn't flaunt it like that. I don't want to hurt you. Please, can we not talk about this? I love you, honey. I want things to be perfect between us. Can't you let me do that? I'll make sure you never regret it. I promise. Jonathan shook his head. Tell me when you stop seeing him. If I'm still around, we'll see if our marriage can be saved. He turned and walked out the door, not wanting to continue the useless conversation. Next, he made himself a sandwich and watched his wife take call after call in the bedroom. She came up to him as he was cleaning up the kitchen. That was my grandfather who disowned me. Are you going to be a complete moron about this? Do you really want to start a pissing contest you can't win? 
Stop seeing him, Jonathan said. I'm going out for a while. I'll be back for dinner. It would be nice if you took some time out of your busy schedule to cook something for once. You just got here, she whined. We still need to talk. After dinner? Next chapter. Uh, Taking advantage of the information the judge had received, Jonathan was on the doorstep of the Tudor house within ten minutes. It was a nice house, bigger than his own, much more than a lonely man needed. The door opened. Yes. Jonathan stuck his foot in the door. I want you to stop entertaining my wife. You killed your wife. Now you're killing my marriage. Stop it. The slender, small man raised his head in fear. He leaned against the door to close it, but it wouldn't budge. I... I don't know what you're talking about. Stop entertaining Susan Fremont. Mrs. Jonathan Fremont. My wife. Don't ever get in a car with her. If you kill her too, I'll hunt you down and make sure your last minutes on earth are as miserable as possible. I don't want a murderer entertaining the mother of my children. I... I'm not a murderer. It was an accident, the terrified man said. You killed her. You're living off the money you made from it. You spent that blood money to seduce my wife. Stop it. If you don't, I will, and you won't like it. You can't threaten me, the man whined. Stop it, you little worm. There are plenty of single women in the world you can buy for the price of killing your wife. Leave my wife alone, you murdering bastard. Jonathan walked away, confident that he had gotten his way. Next chapter. If Susan had been angry before, she was furious when she got home. She headed angrily toward him and he walked past her, lifted the younger one onto his lap, and began tickling her, making her giggle. I'd like to talk, please, Susan said, standing up beside him. Then talk. In private. He shrugged satisfied that he'd tugged her chain again. He went back into the bedroom, his wife following him and closing the door behind them. Did you attack him? Threatened him? Called him a murderer? A murderer? She pounced on her husband. Him? I'm not sure. Which one are you talking about? You know damn well. What do you think you're doing? I told him I didn't want him entertaining my wife anymore. I don't think that's unreasonable. You called him a murderer. Yes, I did. He is a murderer. He killed his wife. I told him I don't want him to take you anywhere. I don't want him to kill you either. Even if you're a whore, you're still the mother of my children. He didn't kill her. It was an accident. You have no right to say that. He was driving. She died. He killed her. Just as dead as if he'd put a gun to her head. How could you? It almost destroyed him. He loved her. His depression was so bad he almost died. It took me years to get him to the state he's in now. So you're telling me that if I can make him depressed again, he might die, and this whole nightmare will be over, asked Jonathan. And she looked at the man she had been married to for 11 years. How could he have changed so much in such a short time? Become so heartless, so insensitive. You don't mean that. You can't. I'd dance on his grave if it meant you'd be a good, faithful wife again and put this family first. She looked into his eyes and trembled. She had no doubt he was telling her the plain truth. He needs me, Jonathan. If you've ever loved me, loved me even a little, you'll understand. He needs me. Let things run their course. Give me some time. When he's strong enough to be on his own, I'll, I'll give him up. Can we do that? Please? We won't have to talk about it. I'll be discreet. No one has to know. I'll be the perfect wife. Don't make it worse. Do what you have to do, Susan. Obviously, I can't stop you. But as long as you're seeing him, you're my wife in name only. You will live in this house and take care of the children, but our love will be on artificial support. I don't know how long it will last. I know you don't care, but it's only fair that you find out. Don't say I don't care, baby. I still love you. I'll show you. I just need a little time. If you can't accept that, I'll divorce you. I'll take your kids and your house and make rich their father. Is that what you want? That's never going to happen, Susan. You have to know that. 
How can you stop that from happening? The law is on my side. You're going to pay. You'll work hard for children you'll never see, so I can have my love, my home, and my children. You will have nothing. That will never happen, Susan. Take my word for it, he said sadly. Don't put it to the test. She looked at him nervously. He sounded serious. It was obvious. Eleven years together spoke volumes about his seriousness. You're not going to do anything stupid, are you? She asked. Stop seeing him and stop threatening me. He stared at her, daring her to challenge him. She blinked first and ran to the bathroom, crying at the way things had turned out. End of part one. Part the second of May be coming out in 10 hours. Write in the comments if you're waiting for it. Also, give a like under this video and subscribe to my channel. I hope you enjoyed this video.